On our last program, we talked about Alexander the Great and his tomb being discovered in the western desert of Egypt near the Libyan border. On today's program, I'd like to discuss Alexander a little further and the events that happened in the centuries following his taking over of the world. For the Greek culture spread across the known world at that time. In the first book of Maccabees, an apocryphal book which once was uh, published between the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. The uh, writer of Maccabees says that Alexander of Macedon, son of Philip, had come from the land of Katim and defeated Darius, the king of the Mer Persians and Medes, whom he succeeded as ruler first of Hellas. And it goes on to tell then about his taking nation after nation. The earth grew silent before him. His ambitious heart swelled with pride. He assembled very powerful forces and subdued provinces, nations, and princes, and they became his tributaries. But the time came when Alexander took to his bed in the knowledge that he was dying. He summoned his comrades, noblemen who had been brought up with him from his youth, divided his kingdom among them while he was still alive. Alexander reigned 12 years, and when he died, each of his comrades established himself in his own region, all assuming crowns after his death, they and their heirs after them for many years, bringing increasing evils on the world. Now this next paragraph I think is most important. Listen to it. From these grew a sinful offshoot, Antiochus Epiphanes, the son of King Antiochus, once a hostage in Rome. He became king in the 137th year of the kingdom of the Greeks. Uh, it was then that there emerged from Israel a set of renegades who led many people astray. Here's what they said. Come, they said. Let us reach an understanding with the pagans surrounding us. For since we separated ourselves from them, many misfortunes have overtaken us. This proposal proved acceptable, and a number of people eagerly approached the king who authorized them to practice pagan observances. Now, Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me this incredible turn of events in the middle of the second century B.C. Gary, mm -hmm. these men who arose in... Uh, Israel at that time sound an awful lot like modern Israeli politicians, don't they? Well, they do. As a matter of fact, you know, the difference between, I guess, between good politicians and bad politicians in ancient Israel uh, was very much like the difference between good politicians and bad ones today. Uh, the good ones tend to believe in the providence of God and the will of God. That is, that God's in control of affairs. The bad ones tend to operate on the assumption that man it is the source of power. And in, in order to achieve peace, you must make uh, a, allegiance, uh, uh -huh. tribute. You must uh, form political bonds with those around you who are also in positions of power. Yes. Now remember, this second paragraph says, Come, let us reach an understanding with the pagans surrounding us, for since we separated ourselves from them, many misfortunes have overtaken us. It sounds sort of like 1993, mm. when an agreement was finally reached with the Palestinians to allow them self-rule in Jericho and Gaza, and uh, eventually then to take over what is called the West Bank area. Uh, Gary, what's mm -hmm. been going on since 1993? Well, since 1993, uh, starting back at Oslo, Norway, uh, in, in the, the secret chambers in Oslo, Norway, members of the European Parliament, uh, I guess you could say conspired, because they did this in secret. They conspired together and said, the only way that there will ever be peace in the Middle East is if we create the ground for that peace. And they began what was called peace process. John Major of England, uh, various other members of the, the European Parliament, including King Juan Carlos of Spain, uh, got into the act and they said, what we've got to do here is uh, make working deals with the Arab, United Arab Republic and act as an intermediary. And of course, then there was the Madrid uh, uh, summit mm -hmm. under the auspices of King Juan Carlos. And, and then there was an Egyptian summit. And then, of course, you remember when uh, Rabin uh, Yitzhak Rabin came to the United States and Yasser Arafat and the famous White House lawn signing. And, and over all of this, the world leaders beamed and said, this is the dawning of a new era of peace. Well, Rabin uh, 
essentially sold out, reminding us a great deal of, of the story in the book of Maccabees. And you know, it's interesting, Gary, that these European monarchs are actually offspring of the uh, ancient uh, Merovingian dynasty mm. who seem to have roots back in Greece. Yes, they do. And in the Spartans and in the uh, Roman Caesars. Mm -hmm. And of course, finally, roots back to the Seleucids and Antiochus yeah. Epiphanes himself. Now, can you imagine <clears throat> these? These uh, great, 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 great grandchildren of Antiochus Epiphanes yeah. putting this thing together between Israel and the PLO. And by the way, God presiding over the whole thing. One of the great ironies of history. Mm -hmm. You know, in Daniel 11, we have the story about Alexander. And uh, 11, 3 says, And a mighty king shall stand up. Now that's Alexander. Yes. Uh, that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Verse 4 says, And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. And then the very next verse, J.R., really speaks of what we're talking about here. The fifth verse, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall uh, be strong above him and have dominion, his dominion shall be a great dominion. Well, this king of the south was General Seleucus. And J.R., his dominion has been a great dominion uh, because out of the Seleucid dynasty, as it is called, uh, came all of the great rulers of the Middle East uh, that uh, controlled the area of, of today we would call Syria. Iraq, Iran, uh, Turkey, that whole area was controlled by the Seleucids and they were power brokers and king makers who acted in collusion finally with the Roman Empire and uh, the Jews felt overwhelmed and they said to themselves in essence, unless we make a deal with the Seleucid dynasty, there's no hope for us. Yeah. And they sold out. Yeah, they really did. <laughs> Shades of 1993. Yeah. I'll read it again. Come, they said, let us reach an understanding with the pagans surrounding us, for since we separated ourselves from them, many misfortunes are overtaken us. Wow. And so we have uh, the, the ancient statement here recorded in the first book of the Maccabees. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that then came an, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes to Jerusalem after conquering Egypt. At uh, first... Uh, before his conquering Egypt, he had uh, gone down into Egypt, had had a sort of a confrontation with T Ptolemy, and uh, Ptolemy had told him to just sort of get lost, you mm -hmm. know. So he came back to Jerusalem. And meanwhile, in Jerusalem, these renegade politicians, um, Joshua in particular, had changed his name to Jason, and had organized a political party called the Party of Antiochus, Mm -hmm. and had built a gymnasium uh, just south to southwest of the Temple Mount and was uh, introducing pagan worship and pagan Greek games into uh, Israeli society. And uh, when Antiochus Epiphanes came to Jerusalem, he was welcomed with uh, a great acclamations. Mm -hmm. And uh, following that, then he went home. A year later, he came back and solidified his takeover of Jerusalem. Two years after that, he came and built a, an abomination of desolation on the temple site, which some believe was a, temp, a, a uh, statue to Zeus. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Uh, the turn of events here in, I would say, around 171 to 168 mm -hmm. B.C., and what's so fascinating here is, uh, Gary, the prophecies of Daniel seem to relate to this, even in the numbers here. Indeed. I mean, we're talking about a period of time, Jared just mentioned, about a three-year period of time. And the, there seems to be overall about a six-year period of time. That is, three years leading up to mm -hmm. the big takeover, yeah. and three years following the big takeover, at which time uh, Antioch Antiochus stood up before Israel and said, I am God and you'll worship me. Matter of fact, he, he wanted them to worship his birthday as, the, as a, a divine holiday. So talk about ego. And so he commits this abomination of desolation that we can see in, uh, uh, in the Maccabees. 
he makes a sacrifice on the altar in Jerusalem on the 25th of Keslev, and he sacrifices swine on the altar. Can you imagine? Of course, you know that's not kosher, not kosher meat. And for him to do so was a direct defiance of the God of Israel. And historians have called this the abomination of desolation. Now, in Daniel chapter 8, we have some interesting things uh, here concerning 2,300 days. From, uh, and the question is asked, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Mm -hmm. now, the big problem here is that this 2,300 days has been a real head scratcher down through history. Oh, it Gary, has. Uh, for example, um, there was uh, uh, the man in yeah, 1840, William Miller, William Miller who, mm -hmm. who said that these 2,300 days were actually 2,300 years, and he had his starting point and concluding in 1843, mm -hmm. 1844. That's right. Or what he said would be the rapture of, of the church, the mm -hmm. second coming of Christ. Didn't come off, did it? Didn't come off, and uh, William Miller was uh, a man greatly disappointed because he thought he had a lock on the 2300 years. Actually, J.R., what this says in verse 14 is unto 2300 evenings, mornings. It doesn't really say days, it says evenings, mornings, or evenings and mornings. Which is quite specific, isn't it? It really is. It seems to suggest a 24-hour period of time, 2,300 2, literal 24-hour periods of time, mm -hmm. rather than years. And now this, uh, this, as we have uh, pointed out uh, prior, but we're going to discuss it in a little more depth, this works out, dip, uh, depending on how you figure it, to either 6.38 years or 6.29 years, depending on whether you use 360 days per year, as in a prophetic calendar year, or 365.24 years. But we're talking about a period of roughly 6.3 years, or mm, six years and four months, perhaps. Yeah. Well, we know that Alexand that um, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, his machinations extended mm -hmm. over a period of about six years. So it's possible that this prophecy concerned Antiochus Epiphanes. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's very possible. In fact, I think it did. Question is, does it go on then into the far future and suggest something else in the far future about the Antichrist? Yeah, will this, will these 2300 days be fulfilled during the tribulation period that is yet to come? Mm. Now, it's interesting, Gary, that some of the other dates uh, or uh, days that are given in Daniel don't seem to fit. Mm -hmm. For example, in uh, Daniel 9, 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week in the midst of the week. He, he shall cause a sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. This is in the 70 weeks of Daniel. Mm -hmm. Not knowing where exactly to begin, of course, uh, the 70 weeks that are determined are usually uh, begun are around uh, the middle of the 5th uh, century, 445, I think it is, B.C., mm -hmm. according to f the first chapter of Nehemiah. That's right. Uh, but if we started there, the 70th week certainly would not fit anywhere close to 168 B.C. No, absolutely not. So Antiochus <clears throat> Epiphanes was not the ultimate fulfillment. Daniel's prophecy here concerned something that will happen later on in the far future. In the far, far future. Now, what's interesting about uh, Daniel chapter 8, <clears throat> it's one of the few places in the Bible, uh, although this happens quite often, but, but not terribly frequently, that the Bible gives a vision very, very specifically. Then you turn the page and it gives the complete interpretation of the vision. And all that is said concerning the 2300 days is that they are true. Uh, in verse 26, and the vision of the evening and morning which was told is true. Mm -hmm. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. What is, what's meant by many days there? Could that be until the latter days, till the end of days? 
There's, it sounds like the implication there. It does. Now, you know, Antiochus Epiphanes didn't fit any of the other criteria in Daniel either. For example, in Daniel chapter 12, it talks about the abomination of desolation. And it says, from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a little over three and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and then he says, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. So we got 1,335 days and uh, uh, 1,290 days. And they don't fit the three years at all. No. Because the temple was in disarray for three years. And in 165 B.C., Judas Maccabeus, having driven the Syrians out of Jerusalem, rededicated the temple on the very day, anniversary date, mm -hmm. of its desecration, the 25th of Kislev, which corresponds to our December and roughly December 25th, but more specifically to... Uh, uh, to the uh, 25th day after the new moon mm -hmm. of November or December. You know, it's interesting, J.R., as we look at prophetic types in the Bible, <coughs> uh, we notice that things repeat themselves. For example, when Alexander overthrew uh, the civilized world, he came to Israel, he came up to Jerusalem, and as we have already mentioned, he paid homage to the high priest, or that is the God of the high priest, Jehovah. Yes. And then he went his way, allowing Jerusalem to exist more or less as an independent city. Uh, but the point is, Alexander, as a type of the Antichrist, paid homage to the high priest. And then you come down to the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, and you find that, that uh, there were dealings between him and the high priest. And he later turned out to be yet another type of the Antichrist. Well, if this is a trend that's something that rolls over again through history, then it would make sense that in the latter days, whoever is the Antichrist will come along and pay homage once again to the high priest and will, for a time at least, appear to be on the side of Israel. Is it possible then uh, you're saying that the temple sacrifices could be restored mm -hmm. under this uh, uh, wonderful man of peace? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And the man of peace would come along and say, I want, I'd like to pay homage to the, to the Most High God of Israel and preside over the, the uh, reinstitution of temple sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And the Jews would say, well, this is wonderful. This is what we've been waiting for. As a matter of fact, uh, just beside me on the table, I have several uh, Jewish newspapers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are calls in these papers, which I won't take time to quote, but uh, there are rabbinic calls for the quick and early institution of temple sacrifices as virtually Israel's only hope right now. In other words, they feel like they need to appeal to God. Well, what we have right now is Yitzhak Rabin saying the events of the last few years making this treaty with the PLO has nothing whatsoever to do with the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. He's made that statement. He has. He's put, him side, uh, put himself on the side of the renegades. That's right. Now, it's, uh, to me, it looks like the, um, the restoration of temple worship would be a bone thrown to the dog, so to speak. Uh, for the Orthodox Jews to be allowed, mm -hmm. temple worship will be sort of placating them to everybody get along together and be one big happy family. There's a quality of desperation in Israel today. Uh, the uh, February 13th, 1995 Time magazine spoke of what it called a desperate summit uh, between the Rabin government of Israel, PLO chief Yasser Arafat, uh, and uh, Jordan's King Hussein, as, low, as well as uh, Egypt's President Hosni Mubarak. They had a kind of a midnight meeting. They got together because they've got a problem, JR. This wonderful system of peace that was worked out in Europe is crumbling. Uh, the uh, PLO, which now has autonomy in Gaza and in, uh, in Jericho, is using Gaza as a place to manufacture bombs. They've now got more or less a safe haven to import and develop weaponry. And uh, Yasser Arafat seems to be able to, to, to do virtually nothing uh, to stop this. And so uh, they were appealing to the Egyptians, hey, isn't there something you can do to, to help us uh, appeal to Hamas? and 
and um, Islamic Jihad and various other terrorist groups to, to get them to cool it for a while until we get this peace all worked out. In other words, JR, there's still more collusion with the enemy taking place, even as we speak. So the government of Israel is actually still trying to make peace with an enemy that is threatening them. In fact, I understand mm -hmm. that they're, they have uh, asked for volunteers to be suicide bombers and have had more people than they can shake a stick at. Absolutely. There is a, an overwhelming uh, response to what's called uh, jihad, holy war, and the main, main uh, I guess the, the umbrella group for, for all of this is called Islamic Jihad, Islamic Holy War. I cannot imagine people volunteering to commit suicide. I just cannot imagine such a thing. <sighs> and that's a good thing for you, too. But <laughs> they teach among these radical factions that to die while blowing up other people, such as the 21 people who were killed recently at the Beit Lead bus stop in northern Israel. 21 people killed when a bomb went off. And there is now a tape, I understand, a, 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 an audio tape being circulated by um, uh, PLO factions, uh, which is a, it's called the Testimony of the Martyrs, who took place in planning the bombing. These people are heroes, mm. and their religious leaders t uh, t teach that it, to die while planting a bomb like that is to go directly to paradise, the finest part of the heavens and to be wined and dined for the rest of eternity. Incredible. But things don't seem to be doing so well in Israel. Now, the point is, are we close to the tribulation period? These 2,300 days, if we were to place them uh. within the framework of the seven-year tribulation period, yes. then I would have to say that uh, this covenant that he's talking about in chapter 9 here, it says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Is it possible then that this will uh, occur uh, somewhere after the first year of the tribulation has begun instead of at the very beginning of the tribulation? Is it possible he's talking mm -hmm. about that? Well, if you count uh, approximately six years and four months back from the end of the tribulation, uh, this would put you late into the first year of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Something significant might happen. And if we use the Bible as a guide, that thing would be uh, perhaps a treaty or a recognition uh, of uh, the Israeli government by the man of mm -hmm. sin himself. Interesting concept. We can't make any decisions on this. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna have to wait till the prophecy is fulfilled. But the 2300 days indeed has been a head scratcher for theologians down through the centuries.